Welcome, everybody. I am here with the Oracle of London in London, Alexander, and we have a very special guest, an accomplished author, political analyst, uh, TV personality, Mr. Glenn Deason is with us, and we are going to do a very interesting topic today. We're going to talk about Europe being stuck in the middle of the Atlanticists in the West and Greater Eurasia in the East is a fascinating topic. Glenn is the foremost expert on this topic. So, Glenn, before we get started, and I pass it off to Alexander, tell us where can people find you, everybody. I'm going to put a link to uh, Glenn's details down below in the description box. He has a new book that is out, which I strongly recommend everyone purchase. I will put that link in the description box down below as well. I'm not sure if it's out just yet, Glenn, but I have had a peek at the book Fantastic. So, Glenn, where can people uh, find you? Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I'm off Twitter now, so I guess uh, you can be found, I can be found on Facebook or on uh, LinkedIn. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, I might have a profile on uh, yeah through the university, but I guess the social media platforms would be the easiest. And uh, yeah, regarding the book, uh, the the last book, that's my book. It's uh, called. Uh, yeah, the, Europe as the Western Peninsula of uh, Greater Eurasia, so geoeconomic regions in a multipolar world, and it will be out in September, so not quite yet, but it can still be ordered. So, Awesome. So they can pre-order it. And Glenn, where are you coming from? Where are you joining us from? Uh, now from Norway. I uh, yeah, moved here uh, uh, a bit over a year ago. I've been previously working in Moscow and uh, yeah, uh, relocated here. All right, guys, we're going to have a really good discussion. And uh, Alexander, I'm passing it off to you. Europe is stuck in a sandwich, a sandwich between the, uh, the West and the East. The Atlanticist, is that the correct word that I should use, Alexander? The Atlanticist project, perhaps, the U.S.-led Atlantic project, and greater Eurasia. Alexander, the floor is yours. And Glenn, we are looking forward to hearing your thoughts and analysis on this. Indeed, I think Euro-Atlanticist is the sort of favoured term that you sometimes come across. But let, let's actually start with Glenn's book, because just, just consider, take a step back and consider the implications of the title. The Europe as a promontory of Eurasia. Now, he, we in Europe, and of course we are all Europeans, we in Europe are so used to the view that Europe is this great continent in itself, this great civilizational force, this centre in many ways of the world. It's not so long that Europe was actually the political, economic, cultural centre of the world. And now we are, in fact, being told that we're not just the centre of the world or no longer the centre of the world as we think of ourselves. We are part of something greater. We're part of Eurasia. And I think an awful lot of Europeans, an awful lot of political politicians, academics, intellectuals, even business people, are going to find that a very difficult thing to absorb and understand. But I think that Glenn is absolutely onto something when he talks about that, because I think that is spot on. I think that is the trend. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your book, Glenn, and about the kind of things that it is going to, uh, going to sort of talk about uh, and perhaps explain a little bit about the title and a little bit about the kind of political, geostrategic, geopolitical world that it is introducing its viewers, its readers to? Sure. Yes. No. I, I agree with the, the way you framed it because the world as we've uh, as we've had it for the past decades has been uh, one led by the United States. But uh, f through uh, yeah, a long period of time now, the world has had three major economic centers. So you have North America, Europe, and East Asia. So after the Second World War, you had both uh, Europe and East Asia uh, largely absorbed under U.S. Uh, well administration or leadership, if you want. So this was, you know, from uh, U.S. technologies, it controlled the transportation corridors, the leading banks, reserve currencies. And this was, uh, you know, from the European perspective, this kind of absorbed us into this idea of, a, uh, you know, of, of the transatlantic partnership or the West or uh, however you want to uh, define it. Now, Greater Eurasia would be uh, a, a concept of Eurasia as one continent. You point out exactly this idea 
uh, simply looking at a map we see that you know Europe and Asia is actually part of the same landmass. So Greater Eurasia can be conceived as a conceived as a geoeconomic concept so of uh, economic connectivity or integration of the Greater Eurasian space. So everything from Lisbon to Shanghai. Um, so these are you know considered two different continents, but there is no reason why they can't be more connected. So obviously at the center of this greater Eurasian partnership we have uh, Russia and China. So Russia, which was excluded from Europe after the Cold War, found itself at the periphery of both these two economic centers of the Eurasian continent. Both at the periphery of Europe and Asia, and its objective is simply to reposition itself from this dual periphery to the center of a new geoeconomic region. Now China is in a different position. It was allowed, uh, well since the 70s, to position itself under the wing of the United States as a supplier, uh, but still then remain a political object without a proper seat at the table. So as China eventually grew too large to live in this US-dominated uh, Asia, uh, we therefore see that it will increasingly get the same treatment as Russia. So marginalized with sanctions and a wider economic war, uh, military containment, subversion, or internal destabilization, as we call, you know, promotion dem promoting democracy or human rights. Uh, as well as this uh, fierce uh, information war. So China's objective now is also to break away from this US-centric economic architecture and become uh, the leading economic power in this great Eurasian space. So it's from this idea that they both have an interest in integrating uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the Eurasian continent. And uh, I watched on your channel before you discussed this idea uh, as well that uh, this is not new. This is a, was a big thing obviously in the 19th century, but it's now, it now takes on a very different uh, format. So, but uh, it's, uh, it, it is, uh, again, uh, it's intended to create a gravitational pull for uh, the rest of the Great Eurasian continent to, to move towards. So Pakistan, Central Asia, Iran, India, Korea, even the European states uh, will have certain economic interests to connect and more with this. But uh, again, at the center uh, of this partnership, we find Russia and China. So. Uh, and it's based on what we can say, uh, like Russia accepts the concept of uh, uh, China being the first among equals. So it's the more powerful economy, but it, it, but it cannot dominate. So it has to take into account the interest of other states. And uh, again, this is often how region building has historically functioned. You have the economic connectivity come first, which forms national interest, and often political loyalties uh, follow thereafter. So greater Eurasia therefore becomes... Uh, a competitor to, competitor to the unipolar moment uh, under US hegemony. Absolutely. Can I just reminisce a little? Because, of course, I remember going to the St. Petersburg Economic Forum back in 2016. And um, this is, a, if I should explain to our viewers, this is an event which the Russians stage every year, which is basically a business summit, but it's also a good opportunity for the Russian leadership to meet with people and to basically articulate its ideas and views. And the guest of honour was Matteo Renzi, who was at that time Prime Minister of Italy. And I heard Putin talking extensively at that time about Greater Eurasia and basically inviting the Europeans to be a part of Greater Eurasia. And the thing that really struck me at the time, and I met several people from Renzi's delegation, is that it just seemed to wash right over them. The, the Italians, Renzi himself didn't seem to even acknowledge the existence of all this discussion that was happening all around them. And you saw people from China, for example, already there on the margins. They, were, they weren't, in fact, on the margins. They were all over the place. And you could see them talking with the Russians. And the Russians were saying to the Europeans, join us, be part of this thing. And it was as if none of this was happening as far as the Europeans and the Italians were concerned. They were oblivious to it. Do you think this has changed? Do you think the Europeans are now starting to wake up to the fact that this is a real challenge, that this is something, well, not just a challenge, but perhaps an opportunity for them, and that some of the European states have now moved on from that situation in 2016, and they're beginning to see that, in fact, 
the shape of things is indeed changing. And I'm thinking of Germany first and foremost with Nord Stream 2 and with this economic agreement that they've been trying to make with China. Do you think the Europeans are starting to wake up to this new reality? Uh, definitely, because they're faced with a bit of a dilemma. Either they can retreat under US uh, protectionism as they go into relative decline, or they can reach out uh, more towards the East. And Germany is a good example as it's uh, by year by year we see its economic interest, interest shift more and more towards the East. And as this happens, uh, it will act upon these national interests. Now, obviously, uh, the Nord Stream project is a good indication that they're willing to you know, defy uh, American interests. Uh, or defy American threats as well. And uh, I, I think for many, they're coming around now. For a long time, the whole Russia going east thing or seeking a partnership across the greater Eurasia was seen uh, simply to be uh, yeah, a marriage of convenience with the Russians and Chinese. It was uh, not supposed to last and it was expected yeah, to break apart very quickly. But uh, this is part of the reason from the past as well, because in the past when Russia only thought, sought to integrate with the West, it often used its relationship in the East as a, almost a bargaining tool to increase its own market value in the negotiations. But what has happened now, which is really the, yeah, the geostrategic shift of our time, because, uh, and, and it took a while, I think, for, for different countries to recognize that it's serious and still not sufficient, but the more and more are coming around. Uh, because, again, for the past 300 years since Peter the Great, Russia has pursued only very much a Western-centric foreign policy. And for the past 30 years, or at least since the end of the Cold War, Russia's worked towards what it calls what it called the Greater Europe Initiative. So it wanted to integrate into Europe uh, with the West. Now this is, this project has come to an end. Uh, it still wants to integrate with Europe, but in the in the format of Greater Eurasia. So, uh, so I, yeah, sorry. The, the, this is this is the great event because it seems to me that what's happened is that the Russians, who have conceived of themselves as Europeans, are increasingly no longer thinking of themselves as just Europeans, and this is beginning to gain traction. What was it? Was there a single moment, in your opinion, where the Russians said, "Enough is enough. We can't just hope to integrate with Europe." in the way that we once thought we could, that this drive to become a purely European Western country, if you like, which goes back to Peter the Great. What, when did that end? I mean, what was the moment? Was there a single moment? Was it an accumulation of things? Well, yes, I would say the final moment came in 2014. But this is an old idea. This is for the um, uh, like Russians uh, who fled the communists in 1920s. They, they came up with this idea especially Savitsky, they, they recognized that the curse of Russian history had been, it was a Eurasian land power who had throughout its history uh, attempted to modernize and develop uh, based on the Western European model and it had always been uh, contained, prevented from, uh, from uh, fully participating in the European order. So, uh, but again, a lot of these ideas were again revived towards the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, obviously we had, you know, Gorbachev's common uh, you know, European home, it, it apparently began to fail. And, uh, and, um, and this idea that it could become a part of Europe, it, it started slowly to drain away, mainly after the Cold War, because they recognized that uh, Europe's effort to create a Europe uh, without Russia became very quickly a uh, Europe against Russia, because when the largest country, uh, country on the continent can't be a part of, uh, the part of Europe, then uh, it has some implications. For one, um, all countries must choose between Russia and Europe, which is a large part of the reason for all the conflicts we have. Indeed, European integration becomes largely a contradiction because you have a military bloc expanding towards Russian borders, and this is European integration. And all these uh, states from you know Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, they're all torn apart. So you have all this mix of civil wars and uh, proxy wars, and it's... It was all very destructive, but you still had a large part of the Russian elites hoping that there would be some gradual integration with the West. But if you want a final moment, I would say that all of these illusions collapsed in 2014. This is when the EU and the US, in no uncertain terms, told Ukraine you have to choose between Russia and the West. And when it made the wrong decision, not choosing the West, uh, uh, the West supported a coup. And so, so for this a lot of the Russians who had very much supported this Greater Europe idea said, no, the only way forward now must be Greater Eurasia. So again, creating a Eurasian economy for Russia to develop. 
And even those few that uh, still believed that it was possible for integration with the West, they still had to recognize that with the sanctions, they had to diversify their economy and increasingly look more towards other states such as China. So, so this has been, uh, yeah, so I would say 2014 would be the central moment when Russia really abandoned Greater Europe in favor of uh, Greater Eurasia. And it must be pointed out also this is happening at a very extraordinary time. That is for the first time in centuries, a non-Western power, that is China, is rising to challenge the leadership of the US and become the dominant or leading economy at least. So this is all happening at the same time, which really has to be, by historians, uh, pointed out that this is a, was a colossal mistake uh, on the yeah, part of uh, the NATO states, at least. Did did they know what they were doing? Did did they game this out? Did they did they realise what the consequences of uh, uh, achieving, uh, you know, winning over Ukraine and losing Russia would be, or or did they expect that things would turn out otherwise? Did, I mean, was this was this a reflexive thing, or was it just was it just thought out at all? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I think after the Cold War, the main idea was that the West was uh, only real partner that Russia had. So, if it was a bad deal or a good deal, Russia would go for it anyways. And the way often you create uh, power in the political system is uh, through asymmetrical economic interdependence. That is, make sure the other side is more dependent on you than you are on them. So there, there would be, prefer, instead of bringing Russia into the European house, it would be better to have it on the outside where it, without decision making, without a seat at the table, uh, but very dependent on the West, the West not so much dependent on Russia and thereby would still have to apply by institutions which it has no uh, say in. So I think this is the main, uh, the, the main format. I think uh, the rise of countries in the East, primarily China, has changed some of this because now Russia has alternatives. Uh, and uh, uh, but again, the, the, what, what happened in Ukraine uh, in, in the West, we, ho we often point out what a betrayal we consider it to be, but there's not much reflection on how, how what this meant for Russia. This was really the defining moment when it showed that the West could not, uh, there was no, there was no path forward for integration, and there was the West was no longer could not be considered a reliable partner. So um, the diversification has really come across all sectors uh, of the economy. Yeah. Glenn, do you get the same sense that I do that over the last year, perhaps two years, the penny has suddenly dropped, as we say in Britain, in the sense that the West has suddenly woken up to the reality of what's happening in Eurasia and that an awful lot of the sort of feverish activity that you see going on, the, the, the kind of war games that have been played, the belligerent language, all of this is a sort of desperate attempt to try and catch up with events and to somehow try and get mastery over them again and to try to find some kind of solution to this problem that, as they would call it a problem, that Greater Eurasia proposes. Perhaps we can talk about whether Greater Eurasia really is a problem. But anyway, do, do you also get the sense that I do, that there's almost a, a kind of maybe almost a whiff of panic in the air, maybe more in Washington perhaps than in, Br than in Brussels and such places, about the way in which the trend of events is, is, is playing out. Yes, I, I guess because uh, well, after the Cold War, the, the, the future looked uh, de like determined. There was no other alternatives. This was the end of the history hypothesis, which um, most of the Western governments based a lot of their policies on, which was the future will simply be a better version of today. And, uh, and uh, any, any country that wants to succeed and be powerful has to align itself under the West. So it, it, seemed, uh, it, it seemed like all, all these other things with China, Russia was merely a bump in the road towards that end. Now, I would say Greater Eurasia comes with both uh, um, challenges uh, but also opportunities for both the Europeans and uh, the United States. Um, but but it's uh, yeah how how uh, the, the the panic in the air. I guess uh, it's it's becoming more evident now. Uh, as uh, but still, like in this country, we have politicians who write that oh Russia just waiting for an opportunity to come back and work with us instead of the Chinese. I don't think it's. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's recognized what this Great Eurasia Initiative means. I mean, it, it's, it often can seem very abstract, but it can be very much simplified and measured. Uh, because in all nation building and region building, you have three main components. Uh, you have development of strategic industries, which is usually high tech or natural resources. 
you have transportation corridors and financial uh, financial instruments. And you see in all these aspects, the Russians and Chinese are not just working hard, but they're coordinating their, effect, their, 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 their initiatives as well. So in the strategic industries that Chinese are developing, uh, trying to develop leadership in all the high-tech areas, Russia's trying to develop uh, technological autonomy, but also it has its natural resources. Transportation corridors, the Chinese pushed in a, more, tri more than a trillion dollars into the Belt and Road Initiative. China, Russia's also having the Arctic Corridor, uh, like a north-south corridor with Iran and India. And, and but just last on the financial aspect, developing their own banks, their own current, using their own currencies, new payment systems. So across the board, they're, they're, they're pushing through with this. And uh, again, uh, for, for, for governments to still think that this is just uh, a put, put on for show, uh, all this <laughs> new infrastructure of uh, billions of billions of dollars, just uh, for show for the Russia to lure itself back into the Western fold. It's, yeah, it's quite extraordinary, but um, I think we've been for so long expecting that uh, uh, that eventually everyone would just align under the West, that uh, it's taking a while for this to sink in. No. I mean, do you, what about this thing that you hear lots of people in the West say that the Russians will eventually rebel against this thing because they don't want to be subordinate to the Chinese and the Chinese are really going to absorb them and greater Eurasia is really greater China and the Chi Russia is dooming itself to become a province of greater China. Do, do you think there's any mileage in that? Do you think that... And does that fear actually exist in Russia? Uh, not to the extent uh, that it's portrayed in the Western media. But again, one has to point out that the Americans have been very open about their desire to split uh, Russia and China. So this, uh, these analyses are also probably intended to stoke some fears in Russia. But uh, I think it's based on some misunderstandings. For the fir first of all, I think they're assuming that uh, they're basing this on the assumption that there's a competition between hegemons. And indeed, in the 19th century and 20th century, Moscow did rival the UK and then the US for hegemony. But these days, the Russians don't have uh, any ambitions for Eurasian hegemony or even global hegemony, you know, despite what the media writes. So Russia does not have the capacity and it does not have the intentions for hegemony either. It's unrealistic and engaging in such a fantasy is simply not in Russia's interest. Instead, we see that Russia seeing itself as a balancer in a multipolar Eurasia. And this is a very important distinction because Russia now doesn't have to be the most powerful state as a balancer. Uh, and it su suggests that Russia can be a powerful ally if you respect its, its uh, security interests. So again, this thesis that they would break up is usually focused, well, it was assumed that it would happen over Central Asia. Uh, because China's moving in, gets more influence, displaces Russia, and they will compete for dominance. However, uh, as Russia has pointed out for a long time, uh, it has. It doesn't no, no longer demand spheres of influence, which is defined as exclusive influence. Rather, it has spheres of interest, in which it argues countries who operate along its borders have to respect Russian national interest. And that's what we see so far, at least, that the Chinese have done. They have been very sensitive to accommodate Russian interest in the region, and diplomacy is largely focused on harmonizing interests. So, China's Belt and Road Initiative is harmonized with Russia's the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union. And for Russia, this contrasts completely with what the West has done, because when the West often engages with its neighbors, it has this explicit purpose of liberating them from Russian influence. So if you look at you know, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Central Asia, there's always this intention that they have to be split from Russia. Uh, Russia, now China, on the other hand, has thought, sought to harmonize its interests. So, but to the extent that China would no longer do that, that would become a big problem. That's why China has this option. Do you want to be the first among equals, which is fine for Russia, or do you want to dominate everything and exclude Russia, and then they might have a trouble, one might have a problem. But so far, uh, I would say China's been playing its cards quite well. Absolutely, because can I just say there was a wonderful illustration of this, and for me, really an eye-opener, which is over the situation in Afghanistan. Because you see the Russians, the Chinese and the Central Asian states all working together in harness. So you have both the Chinese foreign minister touring Central Asia. You see the uh, uh, president of Russia talking to the Chinese and the uh, and the Central Asian states. And you see everybody, all these all these various parties working in concert to come to some kind of arrangement in Afghanistan and no sign that there's actually any tensions between them. It's been a remarkably smooth 
and harmonious process in a way that I certainly would, I, I certainly found very, very revealing indeed. What about the Chinese side? We talked about the Russian side of the equation, and you said that the Chinese have played this game, this, this game extremely skillfully. And I would agree. Is it because the Chinese understand that from their point of view, if they're going to integrate greater Eurasia, they need Russia to help them do it. And at the same time, they know that without Russian help, um, that isn't really a practical option. And if they try to dictate to Russia, it isn't going to happen because the Russians will assert themselves at that point. So that it's actually in China's interests to play its cards very carefully and to work with the Russians as opposed to dominating them. Yes, because, well, uh, Russia's not a, a threat to, to China, so they don't uh, really have to try to cut the Russians down in size. And also, if you want to integrate Eurasia, it's, uh, you, you kind of have to do it with Russia. Now, uh, while Russia can't really be the most powerful state in Eurasia, economically at least, uh, it, it's, it's also true that it's a very powerful ally and it can be a very fierce adversary, as uh, yeah, the West has, has learned the last few years. So it's uh, so it doesn't has all the incentives to accommodate its interests, but none of the reasons why, uh, why yeah why why it should seek to undermine Russia. Now there's this idea which was yeah pushed forward in the 1920s by again a Russian Eurasianist who who, who made the argument that Eurasian integration uh, connecting all these powers would uh, yeah would, would lead to the prosperity of of the entire region. And, and again, the very Mackinder analysis, is, he argued that this contrasted with the maritime powers who, who had interest to divide the Eurasian powers, to control it from the maritime periphery, if you want. So, so, the, so the argument there is if, if you want, if the Eurasian, major Eurasian powers really want to prosper, they have to have proper integration with, uh, across the Eurasian space. Now, so for this reason, they have these uh, systemic incentives to, uh, to harmonize their interests. And because uh, uh, because that that's the only way that, uh, that that they can prosper. So again, in Afghanistan, if they can solve Afghanistan, then that would be great for the, for China. That can be really incorporated into its Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but if it makes it into a rivalry with Russia, which it doesn't have to do, then uh, uh, then yeah, essentially both sides loses. So I think. Uh, um, I think it's only yeah because of self-interest that this Eurasian partnership is uh, yeah has everything it needs to function, and you mentioned Russia and China, but you also have Iran, of course, who wants uh, also to stabilize Afghanistan. You have Pakistan, so you have a lot of these Eurasian countries who can come together for common interest because yeah to bring stability within their own neighborhood, and you can contrast this with the U.S. interest in Afghanistan, which was very openly to make sure that all of Central Asia, Afghanistan, was kind of disconnected from, from Russia, disconnected from China, and uh, also could uh, in the future be used uh, to, to undermine these countries. So it's, uh, the, the interest structures, incentive structures are completely different. Is this, a, is this Greater Eurasia project driven by economics or by politics? I mean, is this something that they embarked on as part of a programme to upgrade their living standards, to develop their economies, to achieve economic independence? Or is it an attempt to create a power block? Uh, well, I would say it has both yeah, political and economic uh, and, and, and economic interests because they're very much tied together. Uh, but unlike uh, a lot of previous former Eurasian initiatives, especially by Russia, then they have they have tended to absorb Russia's uh, resources. So they have to uh, subsidize them, and they, it, it becomes politics with an economic cost. This time, the political and economic costs, uh, economic interests are more or less aligned. Uh, as uh, again, Russia's main interest now, as well as China, is to diversify its economic ties, uh, not to become too dependent on any one state or region. So uh, this is a, you know, a great uh, project for both of them. And also for those who are familiar with, uh, with, with, with Russian history, they, like, uh, a large part of their history has been uh, this problem of uh, establishing, uh, of modernizing their industries and also having reliable transportation corridors, access to finance, all, all of these issues. And a lot of this can be resolved within uh, the Eurasian space.
If I can just say, I mean, anybody who's travelled around Russia knows what an important issue for the Russians transportation corridors is. One of the great problems that Russia has had, in my opinion, to get its economy moving forward in a really dynamic way is the fact that it's actually still very difficult to transport things from, you know, city A to city B. And it's all overly centralised in some ways around Moscow. So it, developing Eurasian transportation corridors and making Russia a kind of hub is going to be an absolutely uh, transformative thing for them and something that they would very much want to see. Can I come to another point? Because you were talking about Russia playing a balancing role. Doesn't that open an opportunity for Europe as well? Because if you're going to balance, if you're going to play the balancing part, the pivot in Eurasia, well, you need to have both sides of the, if, if I could say, of the, uh, of the lever, of, of, of the great arch, to, keep the, to, to create so that you can be the pivot at the centre. Now, you've got, you've got, you're working with China and you're working very well, but with Europe at the moment, you're not... And could it be that sooner or later, when perhaps we've got over this particular period, um, it will be possible, it be easier for the Europeans to start to integrate themselves with all of this, partly because the Russians will want them to, in order to achieve that ability to create the balance at the centre. Uh, definitely. And again, that was one of the problems in Europe. You had this powerful, uh, large Russia, which couldn't really be fit into Europe, which meant that it was excluded. But uh, the incentives for the Europeans as well changes in, uh, in this Eurasian format, even if they don't uh, want it to. Because uh, uh, it's not necessarily in Russia's interest to only integrate with China. As you mentioned before, the Chinese economy is much more powerful. If, if Russia puts all its eggs in the Chinese basket, it, it will have some problems because uh, when you have asymmetrical interdependence, you will have Russia being very dependent on China, China not so much on Russia, and it will kind of, uh, and, and this can make China extract a lot of political concessions, which is uh, undermines the sovereignty of Russia. So they, they're not interested in this. Uh, so they, they, but again, they don't have to defeat the Chinese or be more powerful. All they have to do is diversify their economy a bit. Uh, in order to preserve their, their sovereignty. And this is the interest of other states in Eurasia as well. And you've already seen a lot of these movements. For example, in Japan, uh, you know, they don't want China, Russia to only be reliant on China. So they're reaching out now for more economic connectivity with, with, uh, with Russia. You have the Indians setting up more links now, want to work more with Russia. They even want to be part of the Arctic corridor, which yeah, is going to be an interesting... <laughs> Uh, how, how that fits in, but they're all setting up new transportation corridors between, uh, you know, Vladivostok and, and India. They want to do more manufacturing together to make sure Russia doesn't only tie itself to, to China. And even in Europe now, you're seeing the French, the Germans, they're increasingly making the argument like, why, why are we pushing them so far towards China? Uh, you know, Russia will still work with us. Let's, uh, you know, let, give, let's give up, you know, Russia's not going to turn its back on China, but at least let's uh, let Russia diversify its ties. Let's, uh, you know, strengthen our cooperation with Russia, not push them towards another pole of power. So you have all these strategic incentives now uh, for Russia, for other states to accommodate Russia's role as a balancer. I mean, uh, when Russia uh, unleashed this uh, uh, concept of uh, this institution, the Eurasian Economic Union, Hillary Clinton famously or infamously said, you know, the United States should slow it down or break it up. Uh, that's what they said about this economic union. Now, uh, if, if they consider the Eurasian Economic Union as a way for Russia to elevate its position in Central Asia and have more balance with China in Central Asia, surely that would be in US interest if its main rivalry is with China. So even the United States would have some interest at the end to begin to accommodate Russia. So, so the, the systemic incentives across Greater Eurasia changes uh, all the more for, for, uh, for Russia in, in this space. So. I think uh, more and more other yeah, European countries especially have started to pick up on this and they will need to stop yeah, alienating the Russians on the continent. Is this ever going to evolve into anything like the European Union? I mean, because it seems from what you're saying that that isn't really the plan. It's more a case of developing economic, political partnerships, transportation partnerships, economic linkages between countries 
spanning across this great continent rather than trying to create the kind of or reproduce in Eurasia the sort of EU model of a single legal political structure with a single currency and all of those things. It's going to be a, a, a looser, but perhaps in some ways a more broad-based model than the European one. Is, is, that, what, is that how it seems to you? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, because, well, the European Union has its, it, centralize, wants to centralize uh, well, everything, not, not just uh, political power, but economic instruments, but also wants to centralize a common identity, the common values. Uh, the, again, both the, especially the Russians and the Chinese, they've been very open that, uh, that they see this as strengthening, this economic connectivity is used to strengthen their national economies in order to preserve their civilizational distinctiveness. So I don't think they want to merge into this uh, this yeah, big big blob, uh, uh, which yeah, also probably wouldn't be possible. Um, I, I I once compared it to you know Gorbachev's you know co common European home. He saw it as one big house with individual rooms. Everyone should be allowed to keep their ideological differences. I argued that Greater Eurasia kind of functions as a Greater Eurasian home. That is, uh, they, we should all be in, under the same house. Uh, uh, integrated uh, integrate economies, but everyone should have the distinctive civilizational home. So China will be Chinese, Russia will be Russian, and uh, and, and again, uh, this need for uh, yeah always common values and uh, yeah pave over civilizational di differences. I I don't think uh, there's any any country in the Eurasian space who's interested in this. Is this a threat to the West? I mean, I can't see that it actually is. From my point of view, it's simply a case of countries coming together, trading with each other, building up their relationship, constructing, if you like, their world around them. But I don't really see as this a, an aggressive expansionist thing, which is the way some people in the West who are now looking at this seem to see it. No, and I think, uh, and I think that uh, this uh, uh, the Eurasian space has a nice uh, greater Eurasia has a nice F, uh, format to transit to transition from this unipolar moment we had under U.S. hegemony, which has come to an end, to a more orderly system, a balanced system, I would add, uh, in, in greater Eurasia. And again, at the end of the day, it might be also in the interest of the U.S. if they see China rising faster than they are to have a, a multipolar system of, of balancing where even China's most important partner, Russia, also seek to diversify its economy, you know, work with the Europeans, the Indians, and everyone to make sure that they don't become too dependent on China. So I think it's uh, it, to the extent that Greater Eurasia can develop as a multipolar system, where China merely becomes the first among equals, I think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good format that the West shouldn't necessarily uh, fear. Uh, but, but obviously it is what is replacing the U.S. Uh, hegemony. Uh, but again, it goes back to the idea that um, it doesn't go against the U.S., but on, only against the U.S. empire or U.S. dominance, if you want. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for the Europeans as well as the Americans in this initiative. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think we need in the West to re-examine some of our geopolitical and ideological assumptions in the light of the way the world is changing with Eurasia at its core. Glenn, I, I, this has been a wonderful programme and I think you've explained a huge amount. I'm very, very much looking forward to your book, which I will read with great interest. I urge everybody to, who's interested in these topics, who wants to understand where the world is going and what is happening in the world, and who wants to understand both Chinese and Russian policies, to, to actually look at that book to buy that book and to read it. And can I also say that you can get ample corroboration of everything that Glenn has said by going to the kind of official statements that you see coming out of Moscow and Beijing, and you will see exactly how Eurasia is being built. And it's been really very remarkable because the governments that are involved are quite open about what they're doing. They're not doing this in secret. They're not doing it in the shadows. It just needs someone with Glenn's skill and academic ability to bring it all together and to put it together in a book. So after that 
Glenn, is there anything you'd like to add? Is there anything further, any point you want to make? And Alex too, uh, Alex too perhaps there's some questions you want to ask Glenn since we have him. But I, I think I, I've touched on all the points I wanted to make. Uh, no, I guess, uh, yeah, just maybe one little point because it's often, uh, we often come into the topic of hegemony and I just like to point out that uh, for Russia and China, they often see this as a counter hegemonic project because under the US led uh, hegemonic system, they both lacked political subjectivity. That is, they were both political objects. They weren't supposed to have a seat at the table. Now, I just, yeah, because Russia obviously was known, is known for punching above its weight, but this was larger, largely out of necessity because it faced NATO expansion towards the borders and other revisionism, while China could take its time because it could enjoy a relative status quo as it didn't have this reorganization of the security architecture in East Asia. So it pursued this so-called peaceful rise by quietly building its strength while keeping a low profile, so not punching above its weight. Uh, but, but now, pretty much Russia and China are both in the same boat. They, they don't see themselves as having a position in this unipolar system. And, um, and uh, again, this, well, what is in Europe, this uh, structure where countries are either divided into dependent, uh, dependent allies on the US or an adversary to be marginalized is, is to some extent replicated in Asia. So I think uh, this is the main objective they have. And the fact that they've invited the Europeans to join in and also uh, yeah, to, 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 to construct this multipolar system, it only proves that it would be multipolar and it would be a, China might eventually be able to lead, but it can't dominate. And I think that's an important yeah. distinction to make. Yeah. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, uh, Glenn, the... Um the greater Eurasia, I mean, we're essentially talking about the SCO, One Belt, One Road, and, and all of these various other uh, projects. Um, can greater Eurasia, though, actually exist side by side or even in cooperation with the European Union? It seems to me that in order for one to prosper, the other one has to fall apart because I just can't see the European Union, even though you could say the greater Eurasia project, China and Russia, maybe inviting Europe to, to join. But the, the people in, uh, the, the bureaucrats and the technocrats in Brussels, I mean, they're, they're incapable at this moment to actually do a cooperation with this greater Eurasia project or the One Belt, One Road or, or the SCO or stuff like that. I mean, they're, they're so entrenched in their ideology that in order for Europe to work with Eurasia, and to join forces, the EU would essentially have to uh, go away. I isn't that the case? Uh, it, it, could de it depends what the European Union will be. Uh, one has to point out that the European Union kind of follow this ideology of uh, uh, you know, being post-sovereign, uh, denying uh, the whole competition of strategic competition. But we suddenly see now in the new EU documents they are taking a bit of a turn. Now, there's, now they're talking about the European sovereignty, which should be achieved through strategic autonomy. This is very different from the language I had before. So it, 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 uh, it, it kind of depends uh, because they, are, uh, they do have to take into account very basic geoeconomic realities. And, uh, and, and, and I think if, if it would survive, they would have to position themselves as... As, as an autonomous as an autonomous region, uh, I guess with, within the Greater Eurasian uh, format, because at the moment they're being pulled a little bit in each uh, in every direction. So, uh, so uh, yeah, you have some countries who look want to look more to the east, and others want to align themselves more under the U.S. to confront the Chinese. So they're they're going a bit in in every direction. And I, uh, I me personally, I don't have much optimism. I don't think the EU probably will be around in the current form at least in five years even. So I think uh, there's good reasons for, for pessimism there for, well, for the EU that is. Um, uh, I, w I wouldn't rule it out but uh, it, it doesn't look good and then especially the last few meetings when the EU meets with its Russian and Chinese counterparts it doesn't want to talk to them as sovereign equals. Uh, when, whenever they, the EU casually throws sanctions at the Russians and the Chinese, if the Chinese uh, or in Russians replicate with sanctions, they are amazed. Uh, how, how could they possibly do this? This is our prerogative. Uh, so they still uh, re reject this concept of sovereign equality between them. And, and to that extent, I don't see how they, how Brussels can continue in its current format within Greater Eurasia. Right. W wouldn't conflict in uh, 
in and around China. South China Sea, wouldn't that throw everything up in the air as well? Maybe that's the point. If, if they create some sort of conflict, because we see a lot of tension right now uh, coming from the U.S. and the U.K. in and around, you know, with the ships moving through uh, what the Chi- Chinese consider Chinese water. I, I mean, you're, see, you're starting to see this tension. Is the plan to throw everything uh, in disarray? Well, there's a good possibility the possibility that will happen. That's why one should also be careful about making predictions, because what seems very certain today might seem very might, might be put on its head tomorrow. But but obviously, um, enlisting the Europeans in in East Asia is you know they're not they're not doing much over there. Uh, they can't come. You know, they, they can't really supplement the Americans with uh, with which much fighting power. So the main objective is obviously to, uh, to, to 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 replicate this anti-Russian alliance we have in Europe in Asia, but ideally make this um, transform in, into economic policies as well. Because one of the problems for the United States after the Cold War, it's the Europeans are all security dependent on the U.S., but they haven't been able to convert this into geoeconomic loyalties. You know, the Americans keep telling the Europeans, don't buy Chinese technologies, don't buy the Russian gas, don't trade with the Iranians. And, and it's very hard for them to get this uh, loyalty or, or, or obedience, if you want. So it's, it's easier if, if you add the security dimension to it. To, so the objective might not have to be to, to defeat China and the South China Seas, rather, I think, to just uh, mobilize the world into these camps. So as Biden says, we are the democracies, they are the authoritarians. And if you can have this recast of the Cold War, uh, you know, you can again divide the world into adversaries that has to be marginalized and allies which become dependent. And I think, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that's, a key, that's an area and a direction which we're moving, which will not end well for the EU in terms of this, what you mentioned, the ability of the European Union to survive. It amazes me that uh, the European people don't see this. The people in Brussels, they don't see what's going on. Maybe they do, and they just don't, they don't address it. It's, it's very odd that they see all this activity coming out of China, Russia, Eurasia, and they just seem stuck. Alexander, Glenn, I mean, they just seem well, stuck. Uh, absolutely. Well, uh, I can't, I've come uh, back, as I said, I, I've never forgotten that experience in St. Petersburg all of five years ago. And as I said, seeing it all happening, I mean, seeing people, you know, you huddling in corners, you know, Chinese and Russian people and people from Gazprom and people from China and all talking about pipelines and other projects of all sorts. And there were the Europeans, the Italians, Renzi, and it was all as if they were the, you know, the, they were the centre of attention. When they were not, and it, it didn't seem to, it didn't seem to register with them. And then you came along, and you know, I, I, you know, either people from Italy, primarily from Italy, and I'd, I remember asking them about, you know, well, what do you make of all of this? And well, they just shrugged their shoulders, and then they'd get on to the sort of topics they wanted to discuss. And it was all very strange and very eerie. But coming back to uh, Glenn's point. I mean, one country which, for example, is now reflective of the ambiguities of all of this is Ukraine, because Ukraine, as we know, has a poisonous relationship with Russia at the moment. It has aligned itself very strongly with the United States on every issue, except, of course, that it is working extremely hard to develop a close relationship with China because China is such an important customer of its products and is also the place where it gets the medications which it's trying to use in order to deal with the pandemic. And it's always seemed to me that one of the major problems that the United States and, well, not the United States, the anti-Eurasian people in Washington have is that you can always work up Europeans up to a certain point against Russia. But China is far away and it doesn't inspire the same kind of anger and emotions in Europe that Russia can among some people. And so I think that beneath the surface, below Brussels, below the sort of little ring of people, things are happening which... I don't think even they are really registering about. 
I think the main challenge now with, uh, with, with, with China is except, exactly that the interests are, are, are diverging quite quickly between the Americans and the Europeans, because America is finding its main adversaries to be in East Asia. And that, so they have to uh, mobilize for this conflict. And so at, at one point, on, on one hand, they're telling the Europeans, we need more loyalty from you to fight someone far away. And at the same time, we'll have less resources devoted to you. So it, it, a lot of the, the, the foundations of, of the partnership is falling apart and uh, yeah i just like to add uh, the, the meeting you attend or the sorry the economic uh, conference in st petersburg it's it has to be noted that uh, the, the greater eurasian partnership is conceptualized as or well, well it's at least thought it's not pro pro western but it's not anti-western either and we tend to often think in the cold war terminology as you know going against or with but the the, the simple objective is to make the west uh, less significant for russia so in other words, if you know if they get hit by a lot of sanctions, they, they just shift their economic activity in a different direction. It, 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 it's okay. So you know this can also help to reduce actually tension if if they don't have uh, yeah all all their future uh, bet on the West, then it, you know it can reduce tensions. And uh, so uh, the interesting part is with all of these sanctions, they're just intensifying the move so much uh, quicker because. Uh, uh, Russia just it wants to diversify in the Eurasian space, not to have too much reliance on the West. And, and by putting all these sanctions on Russia, they're kind of proving that, yes, this is a, obviously what they have to do. But even after the sanctions are gone, the people like Renzi often believe that the Europeans will get all their market share back. But, you know, the, the, the Russians are doing the technological cooperation now with, with the Chinese. They're building the transportation corridors with the Chinese. They're de-dollarizing. They're developing their investment banks with the Chinese payment system with China. So, so all of this, uh, you know, this billion, hundreds of billion dollar pipelines aren't going to go away once, uh, you know, uh, uh, the EU decides it will forgive Russia and, and bring it back into civilization. So. Absolutely. Can I just quickly add one very final point, another point, which is that, of course, more and more Ch Russians are now becoming invested in this relationship. So you see China, Russian businesses, Russian companies, people in Russia learning Chinese. It's creating now a lobby of people in Russia who will want to propel this thing forward, who want to see it grow, uh, which in time will perhaps counterbalance the business lobby that still looks towards Europe and which might indeed at some point before very long exceed that lobby too. Gazprom now is, for example, it used to be entirely focused on Europe. Now it's also got China as a major customer and that inevitably changes its perspective. Yep. All right. Fantastic conversation. Alexander Mercuris in London, New York of London. Thank you very much. Mr. Glenn Deeson coming to us from Norway. Everybody, I'm going to put a link to Glenn's book for pre-order, Europe as the Western Peninsula of Greater Eurasia. You guys can find that link right underneath this video. You can pre-order that book. And Glenn, once again, people can find you on LinkedIn, Facebook, not Twitter, correct? Not Twitter. <laughs> That's correct. <yeah. laughs> all right. I'll put all those links down below as well so you guys can connect with Glenn. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for a fantastic uh, show. Take care, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. Bye.